The Klonoa series is a dedicated cult following, but you could argue that it's the poster child for franchise death by obscurity. It's unfortunate to see a series that reviewed really well not get the attention it deserved, causing Namco to cast it aside and pretend like it never existed. While many in North America may know Klonoa from his appearances on the PlayStation, Game Boy Advance, and PS2, Klonoa made a brief appearance on The Wonder Swan. Kaze no Klonoa Moonlight Museum was developed by Namco, published by Bandai, and released on May 20th, 1999. Before I get started, if you're interested in a more in-depth take on this game from a hardcore Klonoa fan's point of view, go watch Exo Paradigm Gamer's excellent 20-minute review of Moonlight Museum on his YouTube channel. Alright, here we go. For the unfamiliar, Klonoa is a Namco-developed series of platformer games. The initial title, Klonoa Door to Phantom Isle, was released in 1997 on the PlayStation, and was a side-scroller taking place atop a 3D environment, not unlike Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards. The main mechanic of the series is the Wind Bullet, a ring which fires a blast of wind. Hitting an enemy with a blast of wind causes Klonoa to lift it over his head, and the bulk of the gameplay revolves around throwing enemies or bouncing off of them to jump higher than you would with a regular jump. The story of Moonlight Museum is pretty bare bones. The Moonlight Museum's collective of artists have taken the moon out of the sky and broken it into shards. Klonoa and Hupo enter the museum to collect moon shards by clearing all 30 visions in order to restore it to the sky. Moonlight Museum, being the first handheld Klonoa game, established how the handheld installments of the series would deviate from the console games going forward. While Door to Phantom Isle featured more action-packed platforming, Moonlight Museum would opt to go with a more puzzle-based approach. These kinds of shifts were common for handheld games at the time, as developers assumed you were more likely to be distracted when playing on the go, and wanted to make games fit into that context while also retaining the flavor that made people fans of those games in the first place. Door to Phantom Isle also featured a mechanic where enemies could be thrown into the background scenery. However, this was cut, as this game is fully 2D and doesn't allow any kind of interaction with the background plane. The character sprites and backgrounds are well done, and while nothing amazing today, they were very good for a handheld platformer at the time, especially considering that they only had a few shades of grey to work with. Unfortunately, the same can't be said about the soundtrack. Moonlight Museum's soundtrack feels unnecessarily dissonant and unsettling at times, and it can get grating pretty fast. Moonlight Museum is the second game on the Wonder Swan to occasionally make the player switch into portrait orientation to play special levels. This is fine on authentic hardware, as you can just turn the device and keep trucking along, but this can be maddening to play via emulation due to the controls needing to be rebound every single time. As such, I would only recommend playing through this game on real hardware if possible. If you've never played a Klonoa game before, is Moonlight Museum a good introduction to the series? Well, Moonlight Museum is more like a proof of concept that Klonoa could work on a handheld system. An Empire of Dreams on the Game Boy Advance just does everything it was trying to do better, plus it wasn't color. I would recommend that game for newbies, as it's going to give you a much better first impression of the series. The PS1 and PS2 titles are also fantastic, but they each have their own different twist on the formula. If you're a Klonoa fan that's thirsty for more, then Moonlight Museum is indeed more handheld Klonoa, so you might as well just play it, because it's not like there's going to be any more Klonoa on the way anytime soon.